Hello, I'm John Schneider. As a kid, I'd come to the New Jersey Bayshore to visit my grandma Vi and take home movies of what I saw. Today, I live here, produce video documentaries, and recently shot this boat at night with my video camera. Where is the Jersey Bayshore? Well, let's start with the big picture. It's somewhere in here, part of the universe, and it's definitely part of our world, but it's like no place I've ever experienced. And as soon as we land, I'll show you around. My name is Bill Jackson, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nike Integrated Fire Control Area out here on Sandy Hook that's now part of Gateway National Park. Stalin was upset that he was not uh, informed that uh, the United States was building the, uh, the nuclear devices that were dropped on Japan at the close of World War II. We had uh, we'd only shared that information and uh, that technology, really, with uh, our allies the British and Stalin was not happy with that and uh, he undertook uh, attempts to gather the information necessary to build their own device and which wound up resulting in the, uh, the Rosenberg spy trial. It didn't take them long. They detonated their device and then the panic hit because the Soviets now had the bomb, and they were, they were threatening us. The reason that we were here, the Nike bases, was to counter the threat posed by the Soviet Union in their Tu-95 Bear bomber. The uh, Soviet Union used to fly this bomber up and down the east coast of the United States during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now, the, the Bear bomber is a subsonic bomber, Top speed's about 550, 575 miles per hour. However, it's got a tremendous range. It can fly over 9,600 miles on one load of fuel. Once Cuba fell under the sphere of influence of the uh, Soviet Union, these bombers would fly all the way to Cuba, land, refuel, return to the Soviet Union. We had Soviet subs, of course, and but the bombers were the... Uh, the threat that we were here to counter. The, su the subs, we left those to the uh, Navy. That's why they had attack submarines. The Navy was tracking those subs. Uh, we had a network of uh, sonar sensors, SOSIS, that were embedded in the sea floor so that they could track these subs as they came down. You could hear the subs and we would vector our attack submarines and they would shadow the 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 Soviet missile subs, the boomers. The uh, SOSA system was so sensitive that they would be able to hear the bear bombers as they came down. The bear bomber is a very loud, noisy plane with those uh, counter-rotating turboprop propellers. Hell of a racket. On several instances, they got within our, what we called our air defense identification zone, which is about 250 or so miles offshore. They got within that. We, we had air corridors. If they were, it had been negotiated so long as they stayed in those air corridors, everything was hunky-dory. But when these bombers would turn, we would be alerted. They would also alert a fighter interceptors. Fighter interceptors would take off. As soon as they got airborne, they'd go supersonic, fire up their afterburners. And their job was to head out there and turn that bomber and if they were unable to turn them, shoot them down. If they were unable to shoot them down, our job was to take them out. When uh, one of these bombers would turn and start to come in, we would get the alert and we would start preparing missiles to engage them. Usually they'd fly in from only five, 10 minutes or so and turn around and fly back out. And we've gotten nowhere near ready to shoot in that short period of time. However, I can talk about one instance that took place in the uh, 
the summer of 1970. The, uh, the blue light illuminated, uh, the siren went off, everybody dropped what they were doing, they ran to their battle stations. When these guys up here and down uh, the panel operator put their handset headsets on, they would hear a code word that would let them know whether or not this was a uh, drill or, or not. If it had been a drill, they wouldn't have heard the code word blazing skies. But what they heard instead was battle stations, battle stations, get those mm -mm missiles up. That let us know right away that this was not a drill. We were actually going to get ready to shoot. This was the first time, really, that our unit had gone to battle stations. And uh, that meant we were actually going to remove the safe plug from the warhead wiring harness, we're not going to simulate it, and we were going to install the arm plug. That completes the detonation circuit to that nuclear warhead. Was, my God, what? What? We're about to we're about to launch a missile, because during crew drills, all we would do is we would simulate, we'd reach in to that that warhead hatch, put our hand on the safe plug, and and say, removing safe plug, installing arm plug, and then seal the hatch. Uh, it, it, it was it was a nervous time. I, I had the butterflies in my stomach. I know I did. I know everybody up here had the same. You know, it, it was every one of us was going around saying, what the fuck is going on? You're, you're in right now the battery control van. And this is where the, uh, this is the actual command and control facility for the battery. And inside here, you would have uh, a number of personnel. The first uh, one to talk about is the computer operator. Uh, his job is to operate the computer. He may or may not have also operated our communications terminal, which is right over here, an SB22 telephone switchboard. Uh, we had another man that would be right up behind here, and he would be in contact with our higher headquarters, the ADCAP, and he would be receiving early warning plotting data that he would plot on this plotting board using a grease pencil. Uh, the next man is at the end of this console down here. He was your acquisition radar operator. He controlled both the acquisition, the low power acquisition radar, and the high power acquisition radar. He'd start out using the high power because it had the greater range, over 225 miles. And as the target came in closer, and got within range of the low power acquisition radar, he could toggle down and use the low power acquisition radar. Uh, that radar had a range of about 140 miles. Now, he shared his scope right here with the man that was going to fight the fight. It sat right here. That man is the battery control officer, or BCO. He's the man that's going to launch the missile, and he's the man who, in conjunction with the uh, computer, will be detonating the warhead. The warhead will, uh, at the appropriate time, the computer will send a burst command to the, the missile to detonate the warhead, and the BCO could back that up by throwing a switch to make sure that uh, command gets to that warhead and detonates it. The other van, that is your radar control van. Inside there, you will have your missile tracking radar operator. You will have your all your target tracking radar operators. Now, we had two target tracking radars, and those two radars are slaved together, and they're so that they always point at the same point in the sky. You move one radar, the other radar automatically moves to main, so they maintain that one point in the sky relationship. You had three men that operated those two radars. Our higher headquarters, referred to as the Air Defense Command Post, or ADCAP. Their job was basically to orchestrate the battle. Their job was to assign the targets to the firing units. You're at a firing unit right here out on Sandy Hook. Uh, they would assign the targets to make sure that every target was addressed and no two firing units were firing their missiles at the same target, wasting missiles. Now, they utilized Air Force radars, which had a tremendous range advantage over Army radars that we had down here. That, that information would be all be fed to uh, NORAD, Cheyenne Mountain, that facility deep in the heart of a mountain. And then from there, the information is flashed back out to the, the ADCAPs around the United States 
and from the ad caps down to the firing units. The fire control types were for the most part not allowed down in the launching area. They didn't have a need to know. The launching area personnel were not allowed up here. We didn't have a need to know what was going on up here. You know, you, fire control people, you do your job. Launching people, you do your job. Between the two of you, the job would get done. But, you know, you're not going to exchange information for the most part. Uh, when you were in the barracks, yeah, you, you could hang around and, and have friends up there like that. But uh, you would spend mo more of your, most of your time in your particular area. And so you, were, you became uh, better friends, faster friends, more bonded friends with your compatriots that actually served uh, right alongside you in the launching area or the fire control as it may be. And they had a ready room here where they had some bunk beds inside there. So when the crew was hot, uh, when we were the prime unit to engage a target at short notice, you had to be manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, that doesn't mean that you had to stay awake all 24 hours. Uh, you would have to have at least one man in this van, one man in that van over there at all times monitoring the electronic equipment because it's turned on, ready to go. Uh, the rest of the crew, they could be relaxing, reading books, taking, you know, cat naps, you know, the, the hot racks, switch off and everything. Uh, catch a little shut eye during that 24 hour period. The, uh, but you were always had to be able to respond very quickly down in the launching area. You had a guard that manned the gate into the admin area. You had another guard that manned the gate into the limit area and you had two guards during the day at the gate for the exclusion area. At night, you'd have one man in that guard shack monitoring the electronic, uh, the, uh, the security alarm system for the magazines. And the other guy would be a dog handler with a, the most vicious German shepherd you'd never want to meet. He's patrolling the, around the exclusion area within the confines of the limit area with his, his puppy. 24 Nike Hercules that we had out here were armed with nuclear warheads. What size? Smallest warhead had, had a yield of two kilotons. The largest had a yield of 40 kilotons. The, uh, we had an intermediate size with a yield of 20 kilotons. We still consider that one a large. The, uh, to give you a frame of reference, the devices were dropped, that were dropped on uh, Japan at the close of World War II, those devices had uh, yields in the range of 12 to, 12 to 17 kilotons. If we had gotten to the point where we actually elevated and we were going to shoot, you would only fire one missile because a missile has to be guided 100% of the time and it's guided via a radar. We only have one of those radars and that radar locks onto the missile and stays locked on the missile through the launch flight and detonation of the warhead. That bear bomber was probably, I, I don't know exactly, it was probably within three, about 300 miles or so of the coast. Uh, from time for launch, for us to reach our maximum range, and we, what we'd be trying to do is take that bomber out at our maximum range, 100 miles, you can cover that in one to two minutes. Three and a half times the speed of sound. 2,700 miles per hour. Uh, and it's coming down on them because the Nike Hercules would go up above 150,000 feet. Hired man bombers could fly. And then it would be come down on the bomber. Down in that launching area, we had 16 Nike Hercules missiles sitting on launchers, ready to perform the last electrical check and elect electrical connection before we elevated. When we were told, hold fire. We held fire for an hour. At the end of that hour, we were finally told, secure, which meant we just put the, brought the missiles back down into the magazine, took out all the arm plugs, and reinstalled the safe plugs, plugged the missiles back up, turned on the missile heat to keep the missiles nice and warm and ready to go. And we, as we walked out, we're saying, what the heck was going on? We were told, Soviet bomber, straight into our airspace, you don't talk about this. Believe me, the atmosphere here 
was very, very tense, both in the fire control and the launching area, because we realized that we were about to step over the threshold into World War III with this. Uh, I went home that night, told my wife, fix me a drink. Don't ask me any questions. We're standing here inside the exclusion area, the fence line that surrounds the four missile magazines inside this confined area. The magazine closest to us right now, that's Alpha Section. On that day when we had that uh, alert, and actually a battle station's alert, I was down below inside the magazine, unplugging the missiles, installing the arm plugs, and bringing the missiles onto the elevator so they could be brought up to crewman three and four who would move them out to the satellite launchers. Launcher three was located right at this position right here. And when the missile was elevated for firing, the rear of that missile, the booster, would be pointing right down at this blast pad so that when the missile was fired, the explosive charge coming out of there would be dissipated off to the sides. It wouldn't destroy the concrete. During the course of that uh, engagement, we had four missiles in each launching section for a total of 16 missiles topside in this uh, confined area ready to go. This is your elevator platform. Mounted on this platform was a launcher, launcher one. And uh, the control for operating the uh, launcher was up in the upper left corner from where we are right now. This is the elevator control operated by the section chief or whoever was operating the elevator. This is the up button, down button, emergency stop. This is a front access hatch, leads down into the panel room. Uh, if you look down, the ladder that was located here does not have a single rung left. They're all rusted out. Back when this base was open and operational, standing where I am right now, the ocean, it's eroded to the point now where it's encroaching upon the exclusion area. When it was time for a, a missile had to be serviced, uh, taken out of service for maintenance, and uh, it would be brought down here so the warhead could be removed from the missile. And then the warhead would have to be returned up to the launching, to the exclusion area in a warhead container. This is the warhead hoist here. The missile would be brought in here Guidance section removed from the, the missile. You're standing inside the assembly and service building. This is where missiles would be built up, where they would also be serviced periodically. Over here, the dark green, that is a, uh, where the tool crib was, and up above was where spare parts were stored. You see right here an undulating platform. This is the fueling station for the Ajax missiles, the liquid fuel. Uh, when you were taking the fuel out of the missile, you would have to roll it up and down, and up and down to get all the fuel out of the missile. It must have seemed in 1954, you know, like this was like space age stuff. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people look at it today, you know, vacuum tube technology, wow. Yeah, yeah, sure, it was, it's, it's dated and everything, uh, but this system worked very, very well, and believe me, it was highly, highly accurate. Uh, they did a test firing of uh, a Nike Hercules missile with a high explosive warhead in Alaska in a surface-to-surface -surface mode. They were firing at a point on the Earth, the designated target, 75 miles away. They launched that missile up to 150,000 feet, and then brought it down on that target. And they missed the target by three feet. Three feet with a nuclear warhead, you gotta kill. First iteration of the Nike missiles was the Nike Ajax. That's a liquid fuel missile. Had a solid, it was a two-stage missile. Had a solid fuel booster. And, but the missile itself was liquid fuel. Uh, the liquid fuel was nasty, nasty stuff. It was a mixture of uh, JP-4 jet fuel uh, with oxidizers. The oxidizers were red-fuming nitric acid 
and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Uh, that missile was used from 1954 to the latter part of 1959. Nike Hercules is a second generation missile. It, it is again a two stage missile. Once they brought in the Nike Hercules with its their nuclear warheads, that changed the whole ball game. Now fences went up at greater distances uh, and no civilians were allowed. There was a third generation, it was the Nike Zeus. It was undergoing development at the time that the Nike system was, uh, the Nike Hercules was phased out. All we had really to uh, protect us was fighter interceptors and prayer. And that, that's the way things remained until George W. Bush was elected president and he mandated to the Department of Defense that they undertake the development of a anti-ballistic missile system. We organized ourselves, our, our tour group, our tour guide, and created our Fort Hancock Nike Site NY56 Volunteers Association in partnership with the National Park Service, trying to preserve, restore, and present this uh, Nike site. And the present part is our tours. We, uh, during the summer, it's a little tough to get people to come here. You know, they'd rather go to the beaches. People that take the tour, we, the tour guides would like for them, the people to leave with an appreciation for the sacrifices that were made by the men who manned these missile bases throughout the United States. And uh, most especially those that lost their lives in providing that protection to the continental United States. The, uh, because of the secrecy associated with the Nike Hercules missile, uh, not that many people were familiar with the Nike system and its purpose, what it did. And believe me, they sure didn't know that there were nuclear warheads in their backyard. Since this place closed, I have always loved to come back here. It gives me uh, a warm feeling, a little nostalgia remembering what we accomplished here and, well, the reason we were here. I used to love to come up here on the, uh, the exclusion area and look out at the ocean. The Ambrose Light Tower was located out there and in the middle of the night you could see the welcoming light flashing all night. It was, it was very, very pretty, especially on a clear summer night. But uh, it's a beautiful place really to have been stationed. I, I lucked out really being stationed here. Compass Rose, and the reason we have this here is we had a gate guard who got uh, a little bored one afternoon. He asked permission to paint a Compass Rose here. It would help him in uh, the next Defense Capabilities Evaluation, or DCE. Uh, he would be able to use this as a reference point. Uh, he painted it all up. He, however, he will not vouch for the accuracy of it. We've checked it. It's a few degrees off. This is... Uh... This was uh, used as a urinal because in this whole facility, there wasn't one latrine. The guys either had to go back to their, their latrine down the hill or they'd come and they'd do their business right here.